Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders. Hey. Woo. <laughs> That's the energy. That's the energy we're looking to start the Sam's show. not going to say I'm anything. I'm Justin Silent Sam. He's the strong silent type. We're going to introduce him in a sec. I'm Justin Burke, joined tonight by Dr. Chris the Chew Man Chew, and wait for it, our producer, Dr. Sam Mazur. Say hi, Sam. Oh, hey, everybody. I had no idea we were supposed to talk before. There he is. Uh, we are joined tonight by Dr. Michelle Starr and two gestating twins that have hit their prenatal nephron milestones. She is joining us while 36 weeks pregnant, which is incredible. Um, what else is incredible is how wonderful she describes neonatal AKI as part of our very special Neff Madness podcast pub crawl series. Welcome to the Crib Ciders Neff Madness podcast episode. Before we go into the content, hey, Chris. Yeah. Can you remind us about the show? No problem. We are the Pediatric Medicine Podcast. We interview leading experts in the fields to bring you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. So we have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. Michelle Starr. So Michelle is a pediatric nephrologist and health service researcher. She works as an academic pediatric subspecialist at Riley Children's Hospital and Indiana University School of Medicine, where her clinical work and research focus are on neonatal kidney disease. And this includes kidney injury, prematurity, and kidney replacement therapy in small babies. So we discuss AKI treatments, including things like theophylline and caffeine, how in urine and gals can be a biomarker of kidney injury, and how sometimes even ninjas can save nephrons. You guys are going to love this episode, urine for tons of fun. Classic urine pun. Of course. Great, great start. We are very excited today to welcome our guest, Dr. Michelle Starr. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Uh, before we uh, get started, just because we're an informal group, wanted to officially ask, is it okay if we use first names and call you Michelle while we're going through questions. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, welcome to the show, Michelle. I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to talk about kidneys and thrilled to talk about Neff Madness. Excellent. So we like our listeners to, you know, just to know you a little bit more. Can you tell us about yourself? Give us maybe a one-liner or something that you're interested in outside of medicine? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a 36-year-old mom, wife, and pediatric nephrologist. I'm a health service researcher that focuses on pediatric kidney disease and particularly neonates and how kidney disease affects their health. And in my free time, I like to watch a lot of Disney Plus, particularly Encanto right now. I still haven't seen Encanto, but I have uh, heard the We Don't Talk About Bruno song multiple times on TikTok. So I feel like I need to, to catch up for my uh, references. Disney Plus is getting us through the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. I have, I have four boys, and we uh, we're on Disney Plus, but we spend more time with uh, some, a lot of the Star Wars stuff. So a lot of Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett these days. Chris is a Star Wars family. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask my question: um, What is a book you would recommend to our listeners? So you guys may have heard this one before, because I feel like for a lot of people, it was a book that kind of changed the way they think about clinical practice. But in shock. Um, by Rana Arwash, who is a physician who spent quite a bit of time in the ICU when she was critically ill, really just changed my perspective on how I talk to families, particularly in critical care settings, and really made me rethink the way that we talk about critical illness and frame critical illness. So it's really been a practice changing book for me. That's a good rec. I don't have you guys heard that one? I haven't heard that one. And yeah, I've heard of it. I've heard of it. It for for similar reasons, but I haven't read it, so now it officially goes yeah. on the list. Yeah. It's a fabulous book. Yeah, it's yeah. a pretty quick and yeah. She's a she's a fabulous speaker. Um, she gives great grand rounds, but she just has a really nice perspective. And um, she's a critical care physician who spent quite a bit of time on dialysis and critically ill in the ICU, um, and just really um, used it as a way to reframe the way that she interacts with patients and families. 
So Michelle, this is actually our Nef Madness episode, um, and we're really excited to be a part of Nef Madness this year. Would you mind, as as the writer for the neonatal kidney side, would you mind filling us in on what Nef Madness is and what our listeners can do? Yeah, so Nef Madness is a March Madness style nephrology tournament, and it is just as cool as I just made it sound. So basically, the way it works is that there's a bunch of different regions. There's eight different regions. And pediatrics and neonatal kidney disease is one of the eight regions this year. And the way it works is basically these kind of regions all compete and there are topics in nephrology. There's CME available and you basically go through and you try and pick the winner of each region and pick it all the way through like you would a March Madness style tournament. Do you have a recommended strategy of how we should pick winners? Should we go with the underdogs, go by mascots? So, or? you know, it's it's challenging because the way that it's decided as opposed to, you know, you can't have these topics actually battle. Um, so it's decided by a blue ribbon panel. So there's a group of nephrologists that basically vote about which topic they think is more influential that year or has the biggest potential to impact patient care. Um, so I tend to do kind of the things that I think are going to be practice changing in the next five to 10 years. The caveat is I am not very good um, and I have never been close to winning. So I'm not sure my strategy is the best, um, but I tend to pick things that I think will change clinical practice in the next five to 10 years. It's a it's a tricky panel to to really get the to get a read on them. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of years ago, the curbsiders, we had a team and we, we won. And uh, Joel sent us all like nice baseball caps. I was trying to find mine earlier. But, That's right. Um, it, it was fun. Maybe, and now we have the curbsiders. So I maybe we should have that. a curbsiders team. The thing, that's, I like it. the thing that's really nice about it is that, you know, there, most of the topics are adult medicine specific. But there's a ton of overlap in pediatric medicine, both in terms of kind of medicines that are coming down the pike, new technologies, new therapies. And so I always learn lots every single year, even things that aren't strictly pediatric relevant. One of the questions that I would like to ask you to know you is where it, uh, did this passion come from for pediatric nephrology and for, for neonatal AKI. Can you tell a little bit? Of, tell yeah. us a little bit about that. So I um, trained out in Seattle. I trained at Seattle Children's, and I um, I actually did nephrology as my first elective of residency. So I started as a July intern on nephrology elective, just by happenstance. Wow. Didn't didn't it just kind of was a random chance thing, but. Where I really fell in love with the field was when I was a resident taking care of patients in the ED. And I still kind of talk about the, I call it the ED board test. The, you know, which patient when they show up on the ED board, are you like, ooh, I'm really interested by that. I really want to take care of that patient. And I find that's kind of the way I counsel people on what subspecialty or what they should be doing. Um, and so for me, it was a patient that came in who was a pre previously healthy boy who was like nine years old, I think, who just showed up with end stage kidney disease. He just showed up with a BUN of over 100, creatinine of 10, hypertension, and ended up needing to go to the ICU for dialysis. And I remember very clearly, because it was like two in the morning, his mom saying to me, why did this happen? He's always been healthy. Why did this happen? Um, and I, like any good future nephrologist, followed along and kind of figured out what happened. And it turns out he was a preemie. He was a very extremely premature baby who had had several episodes of AKI, had had hypertension, and probably had very underrecognized CKD for quite a period of time. And it made me really passionate about this field because not only are there things we can do when babies are babies, but there's things we can do after they go home from the NICU to prevent them from showing up in the ED with unrecognized end-stage kidney disease. So that's really where I kind of caught the passion for both the clinical care and the research of this. And I feel very fortunate to have found great mentors in the field um, and have been able to stay involved with it since then. Beautiful. Um, I love that story. And I think it's very inspiring and a perfect setup for what we're going to talk about today. Sam, do you want to jump us into some content? Sure. Um, let's start with a case. So our first case is going to be Ashley Kate Injury. She's a one-day-old female born at 34 and 4 via C-section to a 28-year-old previously healthy G2P2 mother for preeclampsia. Her initial APGARs were 6 and 9, and she was ultimately taken back to the NICU due to her prematurity. At 24 hours of life, there was a BMP obtained, and it was notable for sodium of 142, chloride of 98, 
potassium of 5.0, bicarb of 24, BUN of 16, creatinine of 1.0, and glucose of 77. Um, actually, before we start talking about the numbers, though, can you actually take us through kidney physiology in a newborn? You know, how long does it even take for the kidneys to fully develop? So that's one of the million dollar questions is that, you know, there's still a lot we don't truly understand about kidney physiology and development, but we're learning more with every kind of passing year. So one of the really interesting things about kidneys in babies is that nephron number is incredibly variable. So that means the number of nephrons that a baby is born with depends on how premature they're born. So nephron number can range by upwards of a million nephrons, depending whether you're born at 24 weeks or full term. So it really starts there because if a baby is born at 24 weeks, they're just going to have less kidney to start with than a baby that's born at full term. Do the kidneys actually continue to develop you know, and continue to grow and add more nephrons if the baby's born early? Or um, or is like once you come out, you're done? So there's some really interesting research that actually shows that you have a period of time right after you're born for a couple of weeks where you may have this what we call postnatal nephrogenesis, um, where babies might have a little bit of time where they can grow a little bit more kidney. It's not like lung where you can continue to grow it and you really can grow out of your chronic lung disease, but you might get a little bit more nephron number. We don't understand exactly how we optimize that. And there's some really interesting research going on into trying to really increase that nephron number. Um, but for the most part, what you're born with is what you got for life. Now, now do each of these nephrons function uh, like a fully mature nephron or do they function not as well? They function pretty poorly. So when babies are born, especially preterm babies, their GFR is really low. So I think this is one of the things that we don't always recognize when we take care of little kids in the hospital is that it actually takes to about two years of age for you really to develop a mature GFR. So for example, a 30-week gestation neonate probably has a GFR of about 20 to 25. It increases as the blood flow to their kidneys improves over the first couple of weeks of life, but they have very poor kidney function over the first couple of weeks of life, uh, which has lots of impacts, especially in kids who are critically ill. And to go back to Sam's numbers, this child, uh, KI as initials, has a creatinine of 1.0. And presuming that Ashley does not have a lot of muscle but does have a creatinine that's equivalent to a you know a seventy t- kilogram man. Um, is this an AKI? Is this something that we should be worried about? Uh, so it's you know it's certainly a concerning number. The challenge is that right now we just have one point in time. We have one number, and it's really hard to know exactly where it's coming from and what it tells us. Um, so the analogy I usually use um, with that is, you know, it's like throwing a ball up into the air and taking a snapshot picture. You don't know whether the ball is going up; it's at the top of the peak, or whether it's coming down just from one point in time. And so really, you need another number. You need another serum creatinine to figure out where the kidney function is going. With a creatinine of one in a baby that's one day old, the most likely thing is that that's that's maternal creatinine. So babies are born with their mom's serum creatinine and then slowly clear that over the first week or two of life. So the usual course is a serum creatinine that starts at about mom's creatinine and slowly descends to about 0.2 or 0.3 over the first couple of weeks of life. Can you define a couple terms for me? Because we've thrown a couple of words, and I want to know how they relate. So we talked about creatinine. We also talked about GFR. Can you sort of describe how those two are related and how we're estimating them and if there are different ways of doing that estimation? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. So creatinine is the major way in which we determine kidney function. So the problem with creatinine, which is, as um, was mentioned, uh, you know, it's, it's made by muscles, is that it can be a really challenging marker in a lot of our pediatric patients, particularly in babies. Uh, but there's a lot of other patient populations. So kids who have chronic illness, we see it a lot in CF patients that they have low muscle mass as well. Um, where serum creatinine may not be a good marker of what their true kidney function is. GFR is defined by an equation which uses serum creatinine and height um, and can also use a couple of other factors uh, which try and be a little bit more muscle mass independent um, to try and give an estimate of what the kidney function is. And going on that, in adults, there's some of these newer mark uh, biomarkers, whether things like cystatin C 
or um, you did a wonderful Grand Rounds at Brown where I remember you mentioned you're an in-gal. Can you talk about what are these other markers? Is there a role for them in trying to assess kidney function? Yeah. Is this not ready for prime time in pediatrics? Or? So I think cystatin C is ready for prime time. I think cystatin C is a very helpful marker. So in adult medicine, there's a lot of work being done to try and move away from some of these estimating equations that use race um, and use um, kind of some factors associated with kind of ethnicity or race as opposed to truly muscle mass or anything else. In pediatrics, um, cystatin C, which is made by all nucleated cells in the body, is actually a pretty darn good marker. The evidence in babies, particularly premature babies, is still not great, but there's growing data that it can give us a better sense of GFR. And so I do often check it as kind of another marker. It's better for chronic assessment as opposed to an acute assessment, but in babies that I'm trying to figure out where their kidney function is chronically, I use cystatin C quite a bit. The problem with those markers, so the problem with both cystatin C and creatinine is that they're markers of damage. So by the time you're getting a change in those two markers, you already have quite a bit of injury to your kidneys. A lot of what we struggle with in AKI research and particularly pediatric AKI research is that we don't really have good markers for the injury before it results in damage. So urine NGAL is actually a marker of injury. It's a marker of kidney injury. Um, and so we are starting to use it more in the field as kind of a upstream indicator um, and try to get a sense of where things are headed before you truly get a change in serum creatinine. So just coming back around to um, to our case here, you know, we talked about that creatinine being possibly being related to the mother. And if we're not going to use that creatinine right now to define AKI, how do we define AKI in an infant? And then maybe we can talk a little bit more about that as we go. Yeah. So... Um, even though it's, I just gave you a bunch of reasons why serum creatinine is not a great marker in pediatric patients and neonates, it's what we have. Um, so the way that we define acute kidney injury in neonates is either by a change in serum creatinine or a decrease in urine output. Uh, so in serum creatinine, basically, in order to technically have an acute kidney injury in the neonate, your creatinine needs to go up 0.3 milligrams per deciliter from a baseline level. So that means it needs to come down and then go back up. Or your urine output has to go down. Both of those are challenging indicators in babies for reasons we can kind of get into a little bit more. But that is kind of the current state of the field. We know our definitions aren't perfect, but it's important that we all at least are kind of trying to talk the same language so we all can kind of communicate and do studies in the same way. And how often are you ordering uh, creatinine to kind of start following trends? Let's say that we're in dealing with a premature child like this in the NICU. So it depends a little bit about how worried you are and what's going on with the kiddo. Um, there's really good studies that tell us that depending on the gestational age, babies' rates of kidney injury can be as high as 50%. Uh, so in a very premature baby, so someone born between 22 and 29 weeks gestational age, their risk of acute kidney injury in the NICU is 45%. Once you're above that, your rate's lower. It's about 20 to 25%. But it really, it just kind of depends on what's going on with the kid. If it is like this patient, a pretty healthy baby who isn't getting a lot of nephrotoxins, didn't have ischemia at birth, had decent APGARs, and otherwise is doing pretty well, I'll usually recommend checking a few serum creatinines just to make sure it continues to trend down to what we would expect. But if things start to change or you start to have risk factors that really would put a kid at risk for AKI, then we start to check more frequently. And let's say in our child, uh, the kid is peeing, we have decent urine output and it's remaining stable. Is, is this a reassuring sign that we can uh, look at? So urine output in babies is a really challenging indicator, particularly in premature babies, um, because they have immature tubular function. And so I'm sure I'm making everybody flash back to their physiology courses. But um, when you think about your distal convoluted tubule and your distal tubular function, it's really immature in babies. It's all the way at the end. Um, so what ends up happening is that babies can't concentrate their urine. And so they will continue to make urine even if they shouldn't be. So even if their volume deplete, they'll continue to make urine. Um, and so a lot of times, continued urine output can be kind of a false reassuring indicator um, in terms of what's going on with a baby's kidney function. 
silly baby kidneys. They're not they're not doing it right. They are not quite completely getting their acts together until they're just about to correct a gestational age. Um, it also kind of there's a lot of other things that they don't do well. They don't hang on to amino acids well. They don't hang on to protein well. And they don't hang on to glucose well. So if you check a urine in a baby, particularly a preterm baby, you're going to see protein. You're going to see glucose. And that's just telling you that their transporters are kind of not quite mature, not quite ready for prime time yet. Um, but that can contribute a lot to some of the tubular wasting we see and also some of the challenges with growth we see as well in these babies. And when should we expect kind of that to normalize, or at least expect it to be as more similar to an older child? You know, is it like, okay, as soon as they hit full term, then we're good? Or do we need to say, hey, at least the first three months after um, after they're born, regardless of their gestational age, they're going to still be doing this? So most babies, by the time they get back to corrected full term, should have appropriate tubular function, um, in particular, the ability to hold on to fluids appropriately um, in the setting of volume depletion or kind of other challenges. Um, that's where some of the math for the uh, fluid equations comes from is actually full-term babies. Um, and so a lot of kind of the extrapolations that we make for the 421 and some of those other fluid management rules are actually based on full-term babies and what their fluid needs are. And so when we identify an acute kidney injury, let's say that we, we follow this child, the creatinine is starting to uptrend we have nephrology on board. Is there any evidence for interventions that can help with acute kidney injuries? So this is, I think, one of the coolest parts of the field of neonatal nephrology right now is, yeah, actually, there's a couple of things that we can do. You know, I get really tired of writing in my notes, adjust nephrotoxic medications, avoid nephrotoxic medications, be nice to the kidneys and check serum creatinines. Uh, so it's nice to see some, uh, some, some studies and some evidence that actually shows that there might be things that we can do to prevent kidney injury, particularly in premature babies. Uh, so there's two things that are kind of contenders for Neff Madness this year that I think are kind of new topics in prevention of acute kidney injury in neonates. And those are um, theophylline and caffeine. So theophylline is an old medicine that we think of in a lot of other contexts, right, in terms of asthma treatment and respiratory management. But actually, there's really good studies that in babies with HIE or perinatal asphyxia, it can prevent AKI, which is fascinating. Um, and it has to do with the adenosine receptors in the kidney, but it basically improves blood flow to the kidneys, can decrease oliguria, and maintain urine output, particularly in babies who have significant HIE. That's nuts to me. I mean, what a throwback to a medicine that's been very much branded in a negative light. I think this could be the comeback kid in Neff Madness. I think this is this is the Cinderella story of Theophylline rising to the occasion and, and winning it all. I'm calling it. Well, the other really cool one is caffeine because caffeine is one that we use a lot in preterm babies uh, for other reasons, right? We use it to help them remember to breathe. Um, and there are some really cool studies. Um, one of them came out of the Neonatal Kidney Collaborative led by Matt Hare, which looks at uh, the risk of AKI in babies that get caffeine for apnea of prematurity. Um, and the number needed to treat is four. So if you give four babies caffeine, you actually prevent an episode of AKI, uh, which is a, a bananas number. I mean, that's really low. Um, and it's a medication that, you know, we all drink every day. So, you know, if you think about it, it's really a great, it's it's a really cool story and really has the potential to kind of change the way we care for these patients. I'm changing my bracket. And is that is that dosing the same as the uh, as the dosing we would do for apnea prematurity, or do you have to do something different? So all of it, it's a great question. So all of the studies which have looked at caffeine have all been either retrospective or secondary analyses. So there have not been any RCTs or any studies which look at caffeine specifically for the prevention of AKI. So that's what's next in the field. Uh, theophylline has been studied in several randomized controlled studies. Most of those are not in the United States. Um, but that is what's next there as well, as I would expect in the next five to 10 years, we're going to have some really good big RCTs looking at these to truly impact kidney outcomes in these kids. So 
right now, theophylline, caffeine, and each of these special cases, not quite prime time as like proactively using, but we're waiting for those randomized control studies to come out before we're really actively doing this like routinely. Is that correct? So some centers actually use them. You know, caffeine is one of those medicines that's used for other indications, but also I think a lot of places are saying, well, if the data shows that it might prevent AKI, maybe we'll use it a little bit more broadly. Um, so some centers use caffeine a little bit more. There are centers that use theophylline um, in the setting of severe perinatal asphyxia to try and prevent an episode of AKI. And it's actually part of the KDGO guidelines, so the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes guidelines, to consider a one-time dose of theophylline in the setting of perinatal asphyxia to prevent AKI. I knew I needed to review my neonatal AKI KDGO guidelines uh, before this episode. This is great. It's amazing to see these medications being a possible treatment and, and dare I say, kind of fun medicines, I think, that are the Avalon caffeine, I feel like, are going to raise eyebrows. And so those are pretty cool. In the unfortunate event where our patient or our neonatologist was unfamiliar with the KDGO guidelines, did not offer theophylline or this patient did not receive caffeine. In the neonate, if the kidney disease progresses, we typically think of going to dialysis. Is that something that's even possible in a very, very small neonate? Yeah. So, you know, the, the first round matchup is really a doozy because it's prevention of AKI. So it's caffeine and theophylline versus these novel dialysis devices in neonates. So it's going to be a hard one to pick, I think, um, because there has been a lot of really exciting progress that's been made in neonatal dialysis over the last decade or so. So the way it used to be in neonatal dialysis is that if a baby had deteriorating kidney function, they needed to be big enough for peritoneal dialysis. Um, and so peritoneal dialysis is you basically use the peritoneal membrane, you put a soft catheter in, you put a small amount of fluid in, you let it sit, and then you use that kind of um, filtration barrier of the abdomen to filter out fluids. It's a slow, inefficient system. And in a lot of neonates, especially those with neck or with hypoperfusion, it doesn't work very well. But it is something that has been kind of the mainstay of treatment for AKI uh, for decades. So one of the things that's been coming down the pipe is that a lot of times we want to use what we call extracorporeal therapies, so continuous renal replacement therapies, which use vascular access as opposed to the peritoneal catheter. In babies, those have been really challenging because if you think about it, everything that we do in pediatric medicine for the most part is an adaption of an adult machine. So even our pediatric dialysis devices are usually off-label because they're only regulated down to about 20 kilos. So anybody less than 20 kilos usually is getting continuous renal replacement therapy through a device that is considered an off-label indication. What are some of these devices? So there's a couple that are coming down the pipe. So the one that I think is um, the new, the newest kid on the block is the very cool named Carpe Diem. Um, so Carpe Diem was recently FDA approved down to 2.5 kilograms uh, for dialytic therapy. And so it's something that's been, been used in Europe for quite a bit of time, but is really just starting to be used in the US. And there's about, there's a handful of centers that are starting to use it. It's a miniaturized dialysis machine that provides all of the modalities of clearance of the larger machines with lower blood flows and lower what we call extracorporeal volume, so less volume of blood that needs to be outside the patient's body. That means that we can use smaller vascular access, um, which makes these therapies a little bit more easily negotiable in a smaller kid. And for the neonates that are going on dialysis, are these often awaiting nephron recovery? Do most of these kiddos usually come off dialysis? Is this bridging towards transplant? What are, what are the general outcomes yeah. for a neonate that's on dialysis? So it's, it's, there's a very big variety in terms of kind of what we see. Uh, so, you know, the two machines that we use the most are the Carpe Diem and the other one is something called Aquadex. So Aquadex is basically a machine that was initially designed for adults with heart failure that's been adapted um, as kind of like a 
neonatal dialysis machine. Uh, Both of those machines are used kind of in similar ways. They're used as usually continuous renal replacement therapy. And they can be used to treat patients for um, a period of hours to days to weeks. And most patients who have AKI have some sort of insult and their kidneys are going to recover with time and with kind of just nephron recovery. We do have a segment of our patients who have, you know, what we call congenital renal failure. So babies who are born with horrible dysplasia or, you know, bad functioning kidneys that are going to need long-term dialytic therapy. And often what we'll do in those situations is we'll use these machines as a bridge. So for example, I took care of a patient recently that needed peritoneal dialysis but they weren't in a place where they were safe for a catheter to go in their belly. They didn't have the nutritional status to heal that catheter. And they were so fluid overloaded, we were worried if we put a PD catheter in, it was just going to leak. So what we did is we actually put them on Aquadex and placed a PD catheter at the same time and then did CRRT for several weeks while everything healed and while the kid recovered. And then once they were more stable, we were able to start them on peritoneal dialysis, stop their kind of ongoing vascular continuous renal replacement therapy, and transition them to kind of more of their long-term home therapy. There's a group of patients that dialysis was just really never an option. Uh, So we can now do dialysis with extracorporeal devices down to about 1.3 kilos, depending on the patient's size, uh, depending on their vessel size. And that really just kind of changes the ball game in terms of how we think about therapy in these patients. So just before we move on, um, you know, we all learn in medical school that the indications for uh, for dialysis for patients are A, E, I, O, and U. Um, and just for the neonate, are those the same indications? Do you mind just taking us through when we would actually put one of these patients on dialysis? Yeah. So it's the same. I still run through the same mnemonic in my head all the time. You know, I think the one, so just t- to remind everybody, so A is acidosis, E is electrolyte abnormalities, the ones that get nephrologists moving the quickest are hyperkalemia, but hyperphosphatemia is also a really good marker just of kind of impaired kidney uh filtration. Eyes intoxication. In neonates, actually that a lot of time is hyperammonemia. So in the setting of an OTC deficiency or some other sort of meta- inborn error of metabolism. O is overload, volume overload, and then U is uremia. So true renal failure, renal dysfunction. In overload, I actually kind of group in anybody who can't get the nutrition that they need to heal. So a lot of times, especially in babies, we end up fluid restricting. We end up calorie restricting because they're not making enough urine. And I feel very strongly that if you can't provide the right nutrition for a patient to recover from their critical illness, then that's an indication for dialysis in itself as well. It's, it's amazing that's the same AEIOU, but I imagine for pediatrics, it's a lowercase AEIOU. <laughs> the E is backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the Comet Sans font. Sam, it's got to go on the infographic, AEIOU lowercase with E backwards, okay? I know. We'll see if I can actually do that, but I think we can find it. Um, so yeah, well, let's take us through the next case. So we're just going to go up in age as we uh, as as we go along for everybody who's listening. Um, so this is Ann Urea. She is a also one day old female, and she's born via spontaneous vaginal delivery to a healthy twenty seven year old, previously healthy G one P one, and she's actually brought to the newborn nursery instead of NICU this time soon after delivery without complication. So now she's thirty six hours old, and she has still not urinated. So should this concern us, and if not now, when? So this is the million dollar question, and I'm sure we've all gotten these phone calls. Usually it's at like 2 or 3 a.m. So the most common reason that a baby gets to 36 hours of life and hasn't urinated is that they did pee somewhere along the way and it was just kind of missed in the delivery room or in the kind of initial kind of events of their birth. I tend to not get too worried until we get to about 48 hours, um, particularly if a baby and a mom have had good prenatal care and we know that they have normal kidneys on imaging. You know, babies do tend to pee. Sometimes it's a little bit delayed. The other thing that I often will think about in babies like this is that your GFR and your kidney function is quite low. And so it can take a period of time for those nephrons to really get up and get running and get filtering. So, you know, 36 to 48 hours is not unreasonable, 
But most of the time, there's a P somewhere that just wasn't kind of accounted for. And let's say that we're getting into those 48 hours or 49 hours in a patient that um, we're starting to get worried about. What is the next step? What is uh, when the nephrologist come in to, to save the day? What's going through your mind? So usually I'm thinking about anatomic reasons. So particularly if it's a patient that didn't have um, a lot of prenatal care um, or a mom who didn't have a lot of prenatal care, usually an ultrasound is my first step. Thinking about causes of, you know, not true kidney injury, but is there an outflow obstruction? Is there hydronephrosis? Is there some sort of anatomic reason that we're not seeing urine? Um Besides that, I always I can't help myself, so I'm usually going to check a creatinine. Um, you know, it's going to give me a sense of where things are at. Now, a baby who has a creatinine of 0.7, I feel pretty good about where things are at with a normal renal ultrasound and nothing else that's really out of place. Um, if it, the creatinine's 2.5 um, and the kidneys look small or they look dysplastic, um, then I get a little bit more anxious and we start to think about what do we need to do for this kid. But that's the usually a uh, set of labs and imaging is where we're going to start with a kid like this. And just a question that I we should have probably asked earlier. So whenever you're getting this creatinine, are we also getting creatinine on mom or making sure that the OBs order that? I always like to know, but you know, I think it's it, it it might shock you how few people know what their baseline serum creatinine is. So, you know, moms may not know. There there's quite a large segment of the adult population who has CKD and has no sense of it. Um, one of the real challenges with kidney disease is that it's really asymptomatic until you get to very very advanced levels. Um, so if I have a kid that otherwise is behaving well and has a serum creatinine that just doesn't make sense, I'll often talk to the OBs about can they get one? Can they just kind of let us know where mom's kidney function is just so we can get a sense of what's going on? And I've had it happen a handful of times where mom had a creatinine of three and had no idea. And you mentioned that you're more reassured if the mother and baby have had prenatal care and if there aren't any risk factors. Can you talk about some of these risk factors of what puts uh, a newborn at higher uh, uh, risk for an AKI? Yeah. So, you know, in all things AKI, it's all relative, right? Um, and we all have kind of our list and our way of going through AKI. Um, I use th the three buckets of kind of kidney injury, no matter whether it's a neonate, a pediatric patient, an adolescent, an adult. So I think about pre-renal, I think about post-renal, and then I think about intrinsic disease, which is really what everyone – puts their hands up and screams for a nephrologist. Um, but for the most part with babies, it's either a pre-renal cause, so they have decreased intake, decreased perfusion, or some sort of obstructive cause as opposed to an intrinsic disease if you truly don't have any other risk factors. The risk factors we think about in babies depend on gestational age. Um, so, you know, in a baby who is full term, you think about things like birth trauma, you think about perinatal asphyxia, you think about nephrotoxins, um, and then you think about some of the other things that might affect their development and their nephron number. In premature babies, it's a very different set of factors, right? So we know they have less nephrons to start with. They very often get lots of antibiotics. They have lung disease. They often have vascular catheters, which can cause problems. Um, there's a lot more things that they have, can have PDAs. There's just a lot more factors and a lot more things we need to think about. And to follow up on the PDA, you mentioned the avoiding uh, or exposure to nephrotoxins. I think of endomethacin sometimes with PDA. Are there other nephrotoxins that newborns are often exposed to that would be common ones to keep an eye out for? Yeah. So endomethacin is one of the most common ones that we see. Um, there's been some movement in the field away from using um, endomethacin. And um, some places will use Tylenol as their first line to try and close PDAs. It doesn't always seem to work as well, but it certainly decreases your risk of causing AKI. Um, the other meds that we see very commonly are gentamicin because babies get rule outs um, or other kind of antibiotic therapies. Um, and then the other is just contrast. So, you know, a lot of times contrast studies can be really challenging just because the the amount of contrast that babies get kind of relative to their body surface area. And uh, a fun question that I admit is a leading question, but are there any uh, fun named interdisciplinary approaches to identifying and preventing acute kidney injuries, especially when it comes 
for medications. So the best you like that name. Segue, that was, <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's this wonderful program called Ninja, um, which basically looks at nephrotoxin induced uh kidney injury and tries to identify baby or identify patients who are at risk. Um, it was started by Stu Goldstein in Cincinnati um, and has been spread to quite a number of institutions which use it as a way of identifying kids who are at high risk um, and tracking serum creatinins. There is an offshoot of it which is called Baby Ninja, uh, which tries to do the same thing in NICUs uh, by looking at nephrotoxin exposure and trying to identify babies at risk. I think one of the major challenges in kids and in babies is that acute kidney injury isn't always identified because serum creatinine isn't always checked. It's a blood test. These babies are already at risk of anemia. They already get lots of blood draws. And so very often our neonatology colleagues are trying not to draw labs every day, um, which I get, but also makes it really hard to figure out where their kidney function is going until sometimes it's a little bit too late. So just to summarize our uh, our workup for this patient, um, so we're the patient's gonna, you know, it hasn't peed in forty eight hours. We're gonna get a um, probably a renal bladder ultrasound to look for anatomic issues, and then the second thing, of course, is we're gonna check that basic metabolic panel, look for the serum creatinine. If that serum creatinine seems to be rising, like we talked about for the previous case, are there any other blood tests or any other tests that you would recommend us getting um, to complete this workup before we go talk to our nephrologist? So really, that's probably the, a good place to start. Uh, most of the time, the, the most common cause of this would be volume depletion. So most of the time, what we're going to recommend is fluids uh, to see whether that's kind of able to improve what's going on in the clinical scenario. And maybe as uh, just to, to close the loop on that too, ah, close the loop, it's a nephrology one. Um, <laughs> The urine output, we talked about how uh, baby uh, baby kidneys can't really concentrate their urine. Is looking at urine output or following urine output offering any data points? It actually can. It's it's not great as a standalone marker, but it especially a change in t over time can certainly be helpful. Now, you have to be careful because in the setting of ATN or any sort of tubular injury, you can get polyuria, which is also inappropriate. Um, but kind of keeping a sense of what urine output is going on will give you a kind of a, another marker of where kidney injury is going. And in babies, kidney injury is recognized much more commonly when it's defined by serum creatinine as opposed to urine output. And that carries in pediatrics in the ICU as well. Urine output defined AKI is very poorly recognized because it can be a little bit trickier both to measure urine output, but also just to pay attention to it as well. And I'd like to ask you, one of our goals on this show is to identify racial disparities and health inequities in each of the topics that we focus on. And I know this is something that uh, you have also been passionate about. And I'm curious, in what ways have these disparities presented themselves with acute kidney injury? So it's a really interesting question. Uh, there have been a couple of studies recently which have tried to evaluate um, whether patients are at higher risk of neonatal acute kidney injury based on their ethnicity or their race. One of the really challenging, confounding factors here is that babies who are um, Hispanic or who are Black are more likely to be born at low birth weight or preterm than um, babies who are not. And so most of the studies, when you think about it, the most likely etiology for that increased risk is truly their prematurity or their low birth weight as opposed to their ethnicity or their race. Um, so some of those factors, I think, can get a little bit confounded when you look at the studies. The thing that I think is actually really interesting here is when we think about factors that affect nephron number. So we talked a lot about the fact that babies' number of nephrons, so the number of actual glomeruli, is incredibly variable. And we don't understand why a baby might be born with a much lower number of nephrons than one other baby who might be born with a much higher kind of nephron number. One of the factors we think about is maternal nutrition. And so we know that food insecurity and maternal nutrition actually plays a role, at least in animal models and some of these kind of early clinical studies in nephron number. So that actually might be one of the factors when we think about social determinants of health and how it affects kidney function and then risk of AKI in the NICU. 
I, I imagine a lot of those social determinants of health are are the pri- even not even confounders, but a lot of the primary causes. I imagine of sometimes a lot of these um, injuries. Absolutely, and I think you know one of the challenging things is that, like I was saying earlier, that preterm babies are just at higher risk of AKI to start with, and so anything that makes a baby more likely to be born early, if you look at it from kind of a causality standpoint, is it doesn't fit on the kind of causal pathway, but might be associated. So all of the studies show that there's strong associations between ethnicity and risk of AKI, um, but it's probably not causative. It's probably more associative, if that makes sense. I think this is bathroom a great, break? before we go to the third case, maybe. Uh, do you, uh, yeah, how are we doing, Michelle? Do you want to do a bathroom break before we go on to the third case? I'm good. Okay. These guys are like, All right. they're hanging, they're hanging there. We're good. This is amazing. <laughs> and you, you're outside of the uh, the high risk AKI phase. So I, we're, in, we're know, in excellent shape. It's when you're a Pete's nephrologist, the, um, the milestones you celebrate are very weird and very different. So <laughs> I, 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 these guys are f- five pounds and six pounds. Um, but like, it was like, 24 weeks, 28 weeks, 34 weeks, like, okay, we got nephrons, we're good, you know, so (laughs) now they're just making me uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right, well, we can, we can push through. This is, this has been, uh, we're doing great time and hitting amazing content. So this is perfect. Perfect. It's perfect. Um, Sam, you want to hit the, yeah, third case? Yeah. So this is our, this is our oldest child now. So this is Nate Fever. Uh, he's a 20-day-old, ex-full term, previously healthy male, and he's coming to the emergency department for a temperature of 101.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Mom has noticed he has been tired, he's not been eating as much, and uh, and his last wet diaper was 12 hours ago. Initial labs are notable for a BUN of 20 and a creatinine of 0.53. We have cultures pending, and Nate started on broad-spectrum antibiotics, and he's admitted to the hospital with neonatal fever. So the first question is, does Nate also have an AKI? And how is this different from the from the one day old? So I sound like a broken record, probably, but it's hard to know because um, we don't truly know what his serum creatinine was before. You know, based on his gestational age, based on his age, I would expect his serum creatinine to be somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3 at baseline. So yeah, he probably has an episode of AKI. Based on the story... It seems pretty clear why. He probably has some pre-renal azotemia. He's volume deplete, um, especially with that elevated BUN as well. And, you know, there's many different causes of neonatal fever. uh, But what I always think about in this clinical setting, depending on the laboratory assessment as well, is UTI. Because UTI can cause AKI for several different reasons. And can you go through a little bit of what are those etiologies that you're often thinking of um, in a febrile or sick kid uh, that is showing signs of some kidney, uh, possible kidney damage or injury. Yeah. So most of the time, what, you know, the the most common reason that babies have AKI in the setting of kind of a clinical illness is volume depletion. So remember that any sort of pre-renal AKI is basically just impaired perfusion to the glomerulus. So that could be decreased intravascular volume. So if they're dehydrated, it can be something that causes decreased perfusion of the glomerulus. So, um, you know, if they have low albumin, so like our nephrotics will often have that if they have heart failure or if they have some other reason just to perfuse their kidneys poorly. And then anything that causes them to have a SERS-like inflammatory state where they really just have leaky vasculature. And so this kid has several different reasons to be in kind of a pre-renal state. Um, and that BUN, you know, I, I don't hang my hat on a BUN to creatinine ratio, but an elevated BUN in that situation is also giving you a little bit of a clue that this kid's kidneys are trying to hold on to things desperately um, and also maybe giving you a sign that they, they just need a little bit more volume. One of the interesting things that we can sometimes see in babies who have a urinary tract infection is um, they can get a type 4 RTA. So they can get kind of a pseudo-hypoaldo picture. Um, and so they'll have... Uh, elevated, uh, they'll usually have an elevated creatinine. They usually have a little bit of acidosis. They can have hyperkalemia and hyponatremia. And that can kind of give you a sense that they have, um, before your cultures come back, sometimes based on your BNP, you can feel like a little bit of a fortune teller and say, you know, this baby might have an AKI because they look like they have pseudohypoaldo. 
And is that only true uh, on day of life 20 or so? Like in the newborn, I feel like in the NICU, a lot of the premature kidneys often had that that type 4 RTA picture. Um, is that the case or, or can that be a harbinger even that early that there might be um, a UTI going on? It can definitely be a harbinger that early. Um, usually we don't see it. You have to have somewhat of mature distal tubular function to actually truly show that. Um, but it can be if you see those markers, if you start seeing that laboratory picture in a baby that is acting funny, um, I'll usually send a urine because it might actually be one of the earlier indicators before they're truly febrile or they have anything else that makes you think about it. Um, plus, it always makes you look really cool if you pick up a UTI based on labs. And that's that's why we do it. That's why we practice medicine. I, I love it. So I'm going to ask a little more of a basic question because – you were saying that a lot of these kids look like, most likely they're probably pre-renal and we want to give them fluids. Can you sort of describe exactly what giving fluids means? Are we bolusing? Are we doing maintenance fluids? What type of, what types of fluids are we, are we using? Are we, you know, I, I know, especially in the adult world, there's a lot of discussion about uh, hyperclermic acidosis with different types of fluids. And then how often am I checking on their creatinine to see if they're responding to the fluids? Those are all great questions, and we could do a we could do a whole episode just talking about fluid choices in pediatric patients. Um, I think one of the real challenges here is a lot of our tools that we use to determine fluid delivery are based on normal physiology, and any patient I would argue who's admitted to the hospital does not have normal physiology. And so it can make it a little bit challenging. So my usual approach in patients who I think that they are out of fluid balance is to try and get them back to balance and then keep them there. For that reason, I am not a fan of multiples of maintenance um, or any sort of fluid strategy that isn't like very clear in terms of what you're delivering to the patient. In terms of markers of volume status, Weight is a great marker, especially in a patient who's getting admitted to the hospital, especially in a small child where they're going to know what their weight has been because a change in weight gives you a really good sense in kind of the short term of what their volume status or their volume deficit might be. Um, And so I'll often start by trying to replete what their volume deficit is based on their weight and then try and keep them there by matching their what I would call insensibles in their urine output to try and keep them in balance. In terms of how often are you checking serum creatinine, how often are you trying to measure your response, like we had talked about, you know, serum creatinine is a delayed marker. And so I tend to use clinical markers of volume status, so heart rate, so making sure that their tachycardia is improving, make sure their weight is getting back to their baseline, uh, urine output, blood pressure as kind of more proximal markers, and then we'll check a serum creatinine usually daily. I do not think there's any added value in checking it multiple times a day. I I really think that, you know, what it's telling us is really what happened a day or so ago. Um, It's a lagging marker. There might be some argument, depending on the clinical situation, on checking an NGAL, which is more of a marker of tubular injury to kind of tell you where you're truly at um, and what direction it's headed. The problem with NGAL is it's an inflammatory marker. So anybody who has any sort of infectious etiology, it's going to be elevated. And so NGAL alone doesn't really tell you much, but NGAL as a trend over time might tell you where their kidneys are headed. I actually love what you were saying about the weight piece, um, and that's something that we could all probably use. Would you mind just giving us an example of how you would do that, kind of to calculate the insensible losses, just so we could do that as um, as doctors here? Like, uh, so let's just take a ten kilo baby. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot like this, but I just want a way to think about this so I can go do this tomorrow. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I think especially. In smaller kids, this is an incredibly helpful tool. And it's an argument for an EHR that actually is integrated, right? Because if you have an EHR that speaks outpatient, inpatient, and in all different settings, um, then you truly know where patients are at and can like really make these calculations. So say a patient comes into the hospital emergency department, they had been 10 kilos at their last visit, and now they're 9 kilos. That means they now have a 1 kilo deficit. So say they've been vomiting and, you know, have gastro. And so you think that this is kind of an acute change. They have poor skin turgor, they're hypotensive, they're tachycardic. So the clinical picture fits with your weight change. 
So what I would say is that this patient has a one kilo volume deficit. The nice thing about the metric system is one kilo is one liter. Um, and so I'd probably give this patient a couple of boluses to equal one liter, try and get them back to uvolemic, and then try and keep them there. I There's a lot of different ways to calculate insensibles. The easiest kind of rule of thumb is just a third of what their maintenance would be. Um, and so, you know, kind of doing your normal math. So, you know, their maintenance, if you consider this kind of a normal patient, would be about 40 per hour. So about a third of that is about 10 to 15 an hour is kind of where you would just keep them for insensibles. Um, that's a way, especially if you're not sure where their kidney function of, is going, to not get yourself in trouble. If you give them insensibles and then replace their urine output, you're not going to check back in in the morning and they're going to be anuric and up two kilos and now on two liters of nasal cannula. Um, so that is a strategy I find very helpful, especially when you're not sure where the kidney function is headed. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. So the other, That's good math. <laughs> the other, I know, put me on the spot with my math. I'd picked round numbers. Um, you know, the other, the other question you asked was about what fluids to give, um, which I think is a really interesting question. Um, this is another place where a lot of pediatric medicine is informed by adult medicine. And, you know, there's starting to be pediatric studies which looked at, um, you know, some of the side effects of uh, the fluids that we give. And I think a lot of times we forget that fluids are medicines, just like everything else, and they have side effects. So normal saline is a pretty abnormal fluid if you think about truly what's in it. It's an incredibly um, you know, acidotic fluid that has a lot of chloride. And so patients who get normal saline, especially high volumes of it, um, tend to be more acidemic. They tend to have higher chlorides. Um, and that's all relative to the patient's size. So especially a small patient, if you're giving them a lot of normal saline, you're probably causing an acidosis. So most of the times, you know, I will use normal saline for kind of the acute resuscitation, and then we'll switch to either LR um, or half normal saline, depending on kind of what's available or where I'm practicing. In a smaller kid, sometimes you'll use lower sodium. So with uh, babies, because of the way that their tubules function, they often need lower sodium. And so oftentimes, as weird as it seems to me as a nephrologist, they'll get put on quarter normal. What I often do to truly make sure I'm giving the kid the fluid that they need for their kidney function is I'll check a urine sodium. And then I'll try and match their urine sodium to what the fluids are. Um, so that might sound incredibly nerdy. But if you think about it, if, you know, someone's urine sodium is about 70 to 80, then half normal is a great fluid for them because you're basically are replacing what they're making. Um, if they're closer to 30, then quarter normal probably makes a better sense in terms of what their fluid you're giving them. Wow, that seems really high level. That's and really cool. <laughs> the, the, quarter, the quarter normal saline always, uh, I've seen that a couple of times and it, it, it is a little baffling. And it seems like in older kids, there's more and more of a movement away from that is that I know this we're talking about neonatal AKIs, yeah. but it was interesting. I remember in residency, we kind of saw that movement occur. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it, th you know, it, you just have to frame it in terms of what are the benefits and what are the risks. Um, the problem with giving hypoosmolar fluids is thinking about it in the setting of critical illness and particularly thinking about what a patient's ADH is doing. And so really the risk here is if you give a hypoosmolar solution is them getting hyponatremic. And so the risk of hyponatremia increases when you give fluids that have lower oncotic or osmotic kind of volume to them. So I usually will not give anything less than half normal. NICUs usually like quarter. Um, but I half normal is kind of where I live usually. And I think we it'd be tough to talk about an eight do an AKI episode without talking a little bit about differentiating some of those buckets you mentioned. And so when let's say we have a patient who's ill uh, and maybe about a twenty day old, differentiating between a, a pre renal state from their illness versus maybe um, maybe they're on vancomycin or gentamicin or ibuprofen or some other. Uh, some other uh, nephrotoxin versus a, an SIADH pitcher. Are you looking at phenas? Is there is there an easy good rule of thumb that we can use to kind of start the approach so that when we call the nephrology consult, they they we've proven that we were thoughtful about it. So you know, phena can be helpful in the right clinical situation. 
I often find that the history and the kind of basic BMP gives you most of the story, plus or minus some renal imaging. FETA can get fooled quite a bit, particularly in babies, um, particularly in babies that may not have normally functioning tubules. What What about looking at the urine? Do we see like casts and stuff in it? Is that useful? Do we see you that in, in neonates? You absolutely can. I think one of the things that can be really challenging, particularly in babies who are uh, lower gestational age, so not like this kid, um, but they can have a lot of findings in their urine that um, might make you concerned about, for example, like a glomerulonephritis, but are truly just markers of immature kidney function. So for example, they very commonly will have proteinuria, depending, you know, most of the time these babies are getting cath, so they're going to have red cells. But yeah, the you know, your same differential for intrinsic causes of kidney injury should still be going through your head. It's very rare to have glomerulonephritis as a three-week-old, but it certainly can happen. You know, but the way I usually approach intrinsic kidney injury, which is usually the one that makes people put their hands up, cry, and call a nephrologist, is the same way I approach kind of thinking about pre- and post-renal. I just kind of march through the kidney and think about what's there. So I think about glomerular causes, I think about tubular causes, I think about interstitial causes, and then I think about vascular causes. And so when you break it down and kind of th just thinking through the tubule, it gets a lot easier and less overwhelming. And yes, babies can have all of those things. Um, it's much less likely. And most of the time, it's going to be a pre-renal cause or a post-renal cause or if it's truly an intrinsic cause, you're going to get a probably a pretty good story uh, for the nephrotoxin they were exposed to, or their hypoperfusion event, or their arrest, or their sepsis, or something that's going to cause some tubular necrosis. But you still should kind of march through and think about all of those things. In pediatrics, we uh, we really don't like shotgunning lab testing. Um, we like to think about each of these pieces. Um, but if you were a nephrologist, just to put you on the spot again one more time. Um, you know, if I'm concerned about an intr uh, intrinsic issue, I'm definitely getting, we talked about that BMP. Am I getting urinalysis and a urine sodium in this case? Or, or hey, should I try to really figure this out before I order any of those tests? Um, I like urine sodiums just because I like doing the math. Um, so, you know, especially in a setting, especially if it's a kid who has an abnormal serum sodium, um, I will usually recommend getting osms and a urine sodium so we can kind of figure where things are at. Um, you know, a urine culture is incredibly help helpful. Urine microscopy, whether it's a lab or whether it's your friendly nephrologist looking at the urine under a microscope can be helpful. Urine engal can be helpful if you have a lab that will run it in an expedient manner so that you actually can kind of figure out where things are going. And then the other thing is just um, imaging. So making sure that you're getting good pictures of the kidneys and the bladder to make sure that you don't have an outflow issue um, and you have normal size kidneys that look kind of as you would expect. Sam, I, I have nothing else. I think we should wrap up. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I, um, I, I think this is great. And, you know, so coming to the end of this amazing discussion, um, what are the long-term implications that AKI has on the future of a child or on chronic kidney disease later in life? So that's a great question. And that's actually what I study. And that's what my research is in. Um, and those are the two teams besides um, our preventive and our treatment of neonatal kidney injury. It's the long-term impact of prematurity and kidney injury on kind of the life course of kidney disease. So the short answer is we don't truly know but we think it matters quite a bit. So we know that babies who are born premature, so particularly those who are born extremely premature, so less than 28 weeks gestation, have a much higher risk of chronic kidney disease. Um, it's usually chronic kidney disease that presents in the 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, years of age. Um, but it can present like the patient who kind of made me want to be a nephrologist in the first place as a 10-year-old. And so it's really important that we think about those things. Now, the question is why? And it's every episode of AKI causes some nephron loss. And so you don't grow back the nephrons that are injured when you have an episode of AKI. And so you basically just can have ongoing decline. All of us lose nephrons every single day. Um, more if you, you know, abuse your kidneys or take NZs all the time. 
But that rate can really be accelerated in someone who had a bad kidney injury. So both prematurity and then an episode of AKI increase your risk of CKD. Um, and in children with chronic illness, it's very common that they don't have one episode of AKI. They have recurrent episodes of AKI. Um, and so often it's just this cumulative damage where they have just a decreased nephron number uh, as they exit their childhood years and start to go into adulthood. Uh, I think this is amazing. I think we, we've covered a lot from risk factors to identification to treatment and long-term implications. Anything else that you think is important for our listeners to go away with or anything that you would like to plug or send our listeners to, to to check out? Yeah. So I think, you know, the only other thing that I always think about is just the importance of identifying AKI and making sure patients and families know that their child has had an episode of AKI. So, you know, kidney injury is often not as evident as respiratory failure or needing a nasal cannula or some of those other things that are pretty physically evident when a child is hospitalized. And so it's very common when a baby has kidney injury, families don't know. Um, it's not always on their discharge records. It's not always communicated to their pediatrician. And the reason that that's important is that there's monitoring we can do to kind of keep an eye on kidney function um, in a pretty in an uninvasive way. So blood pressure checks, urine analyses to make sure that they're not developing proteinuria um, can kind of keep us ahead of the game and really kind of prevent them from developing advanced CKD without us knowing it. And how about anything that we should, uh, anything you want to plug, anything to send our listeners to? So um, I think the group that is doing the coolest work when it comes to neonatal nephrology is the Neonatal Kidney Collaborative. So the Neonatal Kidney Collaborative is for basically anybody who's interested in baby kidney health. The website is Baby Kidney. And it's a group of neonatologists, nephrologists, and other people who just want to kind of do research or advocacy or anything related to kidney injury. And we have a lot of resources on the website um, and everyone should check it out. Way to snag that URL. That's a, that's a good babykidney.org. Easy to remember, uh, good resource. And a final plug for NF Madness. Everyone go pitch your team. Uh, I, I now, I think I have caffeine beating uh, Theophylin and then going past the Carpe mm. Diem machine. Uh, and then who knows, maybe all the way. I mean, it's one of those things where it's, it's, <laughs> The, the, there's usually a peds field. It usually gets trounced early, um, which is always just drives me bonkers. Um, but such is life. I think this is our year. I think this is our year. <laughs> We've been ready for it. There's a couple of there's a couple of pediatricians on the panel, so I'm hopeful. Ooh, yeah, this could be it. I there mean, go. you gotta. That's. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna play the game, you gotta like look at who the people are, right? Because you're like, you know, it's all about the blue ribbon panel. Um, I love talking tr like Neff Madness trash. Like it's it's the it's the best <laughs> part of Twitter in March is just like yeah. hating on the people yes, who is. made poor decisions. <laughs> I, I just have a question that's unrelated entirely. So as a resident, and maybe we could put this in actually if people really like this, you know, as a resident, so we just talked about our nephron loss going on for like a while. I'm just very concerned that I don't drink or pee, you know, for like four years straight. And <laughs> have you seen the and, study looking at um I see you? I saw that yeah. too. Yeah, that was the uh, that was like the joke New England Journal study, right? It, like the Christmas study. And I'm like, now I'm starting to get a little bit concerned about am I now gonna have you know, because am I now going to have CKD early? And is dialysis the thing that's going to get me, you know, at 85 because <laughs> because of these formative years? You know, this is the uh, these are the important questions to uh, to ask. So drink more water and take pee breaks on rounds. <laughs> but the caffeine, maybe the caffeine's protective. Right. The ca that's that's caffeine might be that's protective. Exactly true. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's so um, you guys can totally cut this. But like, so when I went into labor with my son, they checked labs. And like, I was like, actively laboring. And they're like, your labs are all fine. And I was like, what's my creatinine? And my husband was like, seriously? 
like you want to know what your creatine is right now, like between contractions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like, like yeah. you're competitive about your creatine the same way you're like, please tell me my blood pressure's low. Yeah. You know, please tell me yeah. my blood pressure's yes, exactly. right. 18, <laughs> uh, you know, over over 65. Yeah. And you're like, tell me my creatinine's 0.75. Yeah. Just yeah. tell me yes. right now. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. It's so funny. Yeah. Uh, well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, I think this is an outstanding episode. Um, and excited to to celebrate Neff Madness. Uh, with this uh, showcase of your expertise and kindness for coming onto the show. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining the Cribsiders. Absolutely. I had a blast. Thank you. So this has been a Neff Madness special edition of the Cribsiders. It's for the kids. Get show notes and sign up for our weekly Knowledge Food Formula Feeds newsletter at our website at www.thecribsiders.com. We at the Cribsiders are committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, review the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player, or send us an email at thecribsiders at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. A special thanks tonight to our producer for this episode and our showrunner, Dr. Sam Mazur. We also would like to thank our wonderful social media team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook tonight. I've been Justin Lee Burke. And I've been Sam Mazur. And this has been Chris, the Chew Man Chew. Thank you. Good night, good morning, and afternoon, wherever you're at. Take it easy. Bye. Hey, you've already listened to the entire episode. Now claim CME credit. Continuing education credit is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. VCU is accredited to provide continuing education to the entire healthcare team. Check it out at cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information and to claim your credit after listening to this episode.